Amen. Thank you, Pastor Adam. Good morning, church. Good day to be in the house of the Lord together. Praise the Lord. I, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited because I really feel that God is doing something great and wonderful, not only in this church or this city, but I feel really across the nation of Canada, something great is stirring in the hearts of those who believe and those who are seeking. And this morning I want to talk to you, uh, I have a message entitled, The Path to Change. And uh, there it is, thank you. See, we all need change. We have to change from tithes and offerings to the title. And uh, I want to talk to you about the path uh, uh, to change. Because here's, here's what I've noticed, is, is stagnation is really easy. It's very easy to become stagnant in all things. You can become comfortable in your life and your routine and what you do and you arise at a certain time and you maybe go to work at a certain time and you eat lunch at a certain time and you come home at a certain time and you eat your dinner at a certain time and you have your shower at a certain time and for those men, uh, you shave your beard or your mustache on certain days and you have a routine and it's very easy to become stagnant and, 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 and maybe a little dry. And, and this is as a pastor, but, but more so, you know, even more than a pastor, uh, I, I found that it's, even as a believer, it's very easy to become stagnant in our relationship with Jesus. And I think sometimes what occurs and what happens is, is we lose the desire to keep growing and to keep changing. And sometimes we might feel like we get to a certain place in life where it's like we have a moment where like, I've arrived, I'm good enough. And if good enough was good enough, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. Are they serving decaf in the coffee shop this morning? Right? We're, we're, off, to, we're off to the races here. And, and, and so uh, as a pastor, as a leader, as a brother in Christ... You know, as someone who has been spurred on in my faith when I have become stagnant by others in my life, my my desire this morning is just to maybe check in and to see how is your walk with Jesus doing this morning? Would you say that it's on fire? Would you say that things are moving, that the miraculous is happening all around you? Uh, Would you say that God is speaking to you as you're reading your Bible? Maybe you're not even reading your Bible. Maybe you haven't picked up your Bible in some time. Maybe, maybe, Maybe you haven't even started reading a Bible. Maybe you've even never opened up a page. Where are you at this morning is the question that I'm asking you. And here's the good news is that wherever you are at, whether you feel like you're not even close to making it on a daily basis or whether you feel like, hey, I got it going on, I'm top notch here. The truth for both of you is this, is that change is still possible today. And here as a believer in Christ and someone who has made Jesus our Lord and our Savior, we were singing that song, All Hail King Jesus. And I love that part because it just reminds me who's the boss. I like to think sometimes I'm the boss. You know, in the 80s, there was a, early 90s, there was a show, show called Who's the Boss? Tony Danza, right? And, 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 and sometimes I think I, I'm the boss, and, and I'm in control. And then I just got to live a day uh, not going into my word or prayer, and I find out very quickly I'm not the boss, and I'm not in control, and half the time I don't even know what's going on. And so I need Jesus. Uh, not only on a daily basis, but I need them on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. And so this morning, before we really get going, let's pray. King Jesus, Lord, we just acknowledge your awesomeness in this place today. Jesus, I just want to declare that you are the solution to every problem here today. Lord, I just want to declare that you are the healing to every hurt and every pain. I want to declare that you are the answer. I want to just declare, Lord God, that your goodness is new and awesome. Your grace is available here today. And Lord, wherever we find ourselves this morning, my desire is that each and every one of us would continue to grow and continue to change. And as we discuss this morning the path to change, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us. Maybe there's some of us this morning that feel like we can't change. It's always been this way, and it always will be. Well, the Holy Spirit, I thank you that is not the case in the kingdom of God. 
And I thank You that this morning, by the power of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and our minds, that today is a day of change. And I thank You that we will be conformed into the image of Jesus more and more each and every time that we gather in Your presence. Lord, we love You. And we ask you to help us this day to extrapolate from your word some lessons and some leadership keys that can continue to lead us into who you would want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, if you haven't got the gist of it, this morning uh, in this message, I really want to examine uh, a few aspects of what it means to be committed to change in the light of serving Jesus. You know, uh, I, as a pastor and, a, and, and even just as a friend, you know, sometimes I, 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 I bear the brunt of people's frustration. And maybe things aren't moving the way that you thought that they should move. And maybe you've prayed and it, it hasn't been answered or it wasn't answered in the way that you wanted it answered. And, and maybe things have just become a little bit stale. And, 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 and maybe you see other people whose socks are getting blessed off and, and your socks still got holes in them and your, your toes are coming through. And, 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 and all sorts of things are happening. And sometimes people just fair, uh, share their frustrations with me. Anybody ever get frustrated? Am I the only one in church this morning? Does anybody ever get, did, did, so you, you're with me. You feel frustrated at different times. Maybe there's certain things that set you off, or maybe it's the fact that uh, you know and understand that you're not who you used to be, but there's space between who you know you want to be, and, and it's not moving along quick enough. And, and sometimes that frustration can just wear us down. Can I just uh, ask this morning, have you ever gotten to a point where the frustration has just worn you down? You become weary, you become tired, you become sluggish. Maybe you even become a little bit lazy because you just feel like, why bother? There's no hope, there's, there's no reason for me to change or to grow anymore because nothing is working the way that I think it should work. Well, I, here's what I think this morning. I don't think that when Jesus envisioned his followers following him, I don't think that he envisioned us being frustrated, Right? I don't think that he intended us to be frustrated. I don't think that's his desire. I don't think he's up there on heaven on the right hand of the Father going, oh, there's Brian. He's frustrated again. I don't think he gets kicks out of that. In fact, I think sometimes it burdens his heart a little bit. And, 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 and so this morning, we want to just extrapolate from a story that I love so much, so much so that there was song written about it. And we want to talk about Zacchaeus this morning. There was a song, and I didn't have the honor and the privilege of going to, to uh, kids' church or children's church. I did not grow up with Veggie Tales, and so when everybody talks to me about Veggie Tales, I just, yeah. And then I go home and I try to find the episode that they were talking about so next time I could be a little bit more relevant. But there was a song I know about this, about Zacchaeus, talking about how he was a wee man, and a wee man indeed he was. Uh, Pam, you're, you're shaking your head. You probably maybe sang that with some of the people who are sitting here in this room at one time or another, and maybe you're going to sing it next week. I don't know. That would be pretty cool, right? But Zacchaeus, we want to talk about him, and, and, and here's what I've learned about the life of Zacchaeus. Here's the bottom line concerning one's walk with Jesus. Following Jesus requires a deep level of commitment. Without commitment, there is no walk with Jesus. And for some of us, there's a battle that happens inside because we live in a generation where commitment no longer means much. In fact, most of the advertising that you see out there is no commitment necessary. You buy a new mattress, you get 90-day guarantee. You don't want to commit to it, no problem. You put it in the box, you ship it away. Right? Everything and anything that you can think about, commitment is not a big issue anymore. I was talking with an, uh, an, an older couple a couple years ago, and, and I like to just talk. You know, I don't know about you, but I like people. I like finding out about them. I, I like to, to see what brought them to where they're at today, and I ask questions, and sometimes it's probably too personal, but I just figure that everybody's my best friend, okay? That's just the way I live life, right? If you have a problem with me, that's your issue, not me. I'm going to love you anyways, Right? Uh, and, and so I was asking this older couple, I said, you guys have been married, I think they had been married for like 52 years or something, and I said, I said you know, what, 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 what's, what's, what's with that? How did you manage 52 years? I said, at the time, I think I was just coming up on like 12 years or something being married, and, and I was like, 52, wow, okay, 
I got some ways to go here. And so I said, well, listen, as a young man, um, you know, because I, I identify as a young man nowadays, um, I said, I said uh, what, what is some advice you can give to me? What, what would you see as like the secret to a good marriage, you know? And, and the guy piped up, and he didn't say too much up until this point. He goes, Brian, it's like this. We come from a generation when things were broken, we fix them. You come from a generation when things are broken, you just replace them. He said, Brian, learn to fix the things that are broken especially in your relationships and your marriage. For what you do not fix will frustrate and it will lead to bitterness and your marriage will be over before you know it. Whew. And I took that principle and I tried to apply it to every area of my life. Now, if my wife was in the room right now, she'd be shaking her head because there are a couple of things in my house that do need some fixing. But listen, I'm learning. There's only so many YouTube videos I can watch about fixing things that need fixing. Come on. And, and you know, I just learned how to fix a window well. In the last two weeks, I got a quote. The guy came in. All they needed was a couple bolts and digging a little hole. And uh, he goes, here's your quote. I was expecting 500 bucks, 600 bucks. He goes, $4,496. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go to YouTube. And I'm going to fix it. And then if I really mess it up, then I'll muster up the faith to find that $4,000 and 500 You know, I'll, I'll figure it out later. But right now, my faith is in YouTube and someone teaching me how to fix it. So I called my buddy up. Hey, you got a shovel? And he showed up with a shovel, didn't even ask any questions. That's kind of scary, by the way, if you have a friend that shows up, says, I need you with a shovel, and they just show up. It's kind of weird, but they were there. Fix that window. Why? I didn't need to replace it. I just need to fix it. It just need a little bit of repair. And so this morning, we got to take a look at the, the relationship that we have with Jesus. And if there's anything broken this morning, let it be our desire that, Lord, we want to fix it. We don't want anything in the way. We don't want any agitation. We, 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 we don't want any friction, unnecessary friction between us and our Lord. And so this morning, by looking at the life of Zacchaeus, we're going to highlight a couple points of things that we can do to make sure that we stay and remain on the path to change. Because here's what I've learned about the path to change is there's never really fully an arrival place. Because once you get to one change, you begin to examine your life and you go, wait a second, I got to change over here too. Wait a second, my attitude needs adjustment over here. Wait a second, uh, you know, I, 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 I get angry really easily. I, I, I got to work on this. I, wait a second, I, I, my back gets up really easily when people say things and they're really trying to help me, but I get, I get almost irritated and offended. Like, who do they think they are? That they, well, they think that they're your friend and they love you enough to tell you the truth about the shortcomings in your life because they want to see the best version of you in Christ. And you see, so sometimes we kind of come to a place where we got to just say, you know what, Lord, just help me this morning. Help me on the path of commitment. So the level of commitment will determine the level of your relationship. That goes for all relationships. If you are all in with a relationship, it's not that it's going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy, but if you're all in, you'll be able to work through the difficult times. You'll be able to figure things out. You'll be able to kind of maneuver and, sh and shift if you need to shift here or there. This is the old principle of what you give is what you get in return, right? And so this morning, and we're going to look at this interaction between Jesus and Zacchaeus, who was hated by his fellow countrymen for good reason. He was a man who was looking for something different, though. And I don't know about you this morning, but I'm looking for something. I'm looking for a touch from heaven this morning. I'm, when, when, when I, you know, pray the Lord's Prayer, and, and I grew up praying the Lord's Prayer from about the age of 12 on. Uh, it was one of three prayers that I knew. And uh, I, I always liked that part, uh, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And every time that I'm about to prepare to speak, and every time I get up here, I said, Lord, let your will be done on this earth, in this place, as it is in heaven. So Zacchaeus was looking for something different. So we pick up the story in Luke 19. If you've got your Bibles, uh, I invite you to open it up. Otherwise, it'll be on the screen above me. It says here, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. We're getting some details about Zacchaeus here. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on count of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So 
As we observe the connection between Jesus and Zacchaeus, we're going to gain some insights concerning one's commitment to change. And number one, if you're taking notes, is this. Change begins with seeking Jesus. It starts with just seeking Jesus. It says Zacchaeus was a small man. Shout out to all the shorties in the house. I don't know if we got any shorties here today, right? But I love short people because they are the craftiest and most innovative people I know. They will turn anything into a ladder. They're very resourceful, and if I'm building a team of people who are going to help me get things done, I will normally reserve a couple spots, not for the smartest, not for even the strongest, but I'll reserve a couple spots for the short people. Because I know if we arise into a problem, they will find a way to solve it, because they've been solving them all their lives. Zacchaeus was a small man in stature. He was a wee little man, the song says. But physically... He was tiny, and therefore he wasn't able to see above the head and shoulders of those who were crowding Jesus. It says because of the crowd, he was not able to see. This man was actually small in stature, but some would say was the big man on campus. So short, but authoritative. Short, but had great influence. He was the chief tax collector. He wasn't just a tax collector of many. He was the chief tax collector for the area of Jericho, which you could assume was probably a big job for it. The Bible describes him as one who was being rich, financially well-off, wealthy, didn't have to worry about money, had plenty of it. But despite his wealth, And despite his authority and his position, he was not a popular man. Could you imagine? I don't know if you know who the tax man is, but I know this. I don't because he ain't my friend. (laughs) Sorry if you work at uh, the tax department, but uh, I still love you. We just have to have a conversation. That's all. we got to work through some issues. Zacchaeus was no different. He was a reminder to the Jewish people around that once again they were under rule. They were no longer autonomous. They they didn't have say in what happened with with their group of people. This time it was the Roman Empire who was in control of the Jewish people. And as chief tax collector, he collected their money and would send it to Rome who were seen as their enemies. So it's one offense to take money from me. It's another offense to give it to my enemy. So it's a double burn. Taking my money, and now you're giving it to the people who are holding me captive. You're basically funding my captivity with my money. And so you can see that Zacchaeus Zacchaeus was, was probably a lonely man. Probably didn't have many friends, and the friends that he did have were probably bought and paid for. Not the kind of friends that would show up with a shovel when asked to come over to help and ask no questions. That's not the kind of friend that Zacchaeus had. He'd have the friends that show up as long as the parties were going, and as long as the food was being served, and as long as the wine was on the table. But the minute that those things were gone, I bet you all of the money I have, that, gone, Zo. Why? Because it happened to me probably happened to you. Maybe you've been a Christian all your life. I wasn't a Christian all my life. I was 16, right at the height of figuring out who I am, right at the height of figuring out that there's a social pole to climb in high school, and I wanted to be the cool guy, and I did everything I could to get up there, and then all of a sudden, you know, when I became a Christian, I stopped swearing, and I stopped drinking, and I stopped running to Quebec to go get a certain beverage for my friends, and when those things stopped, I found out that I really didn't have any friends. And so Zacchaeus was probably a short man and a lonely man. In this system that was in place, the chief tax collector gained his income by extorting more money from the people that he had contracted to pay the Roman government. So evidently, this scheme worked well for him. Whatever he was doing, he was doing it well. Essentially, he was exploiting the system. He was stealing from his own people and strong-arming them into giving more than was actually required. And so you can imagine the scene here. 
So we see here's that man that had the power, he had the wealth, he had reached what some would call the pinnacle of success in his field. Yet even he knew that something was missing. A man who had all authority, when he would walk into a place, people would probably cower and walk away from him. People that owed money would probably run. A man who had anything that he wanted at any time because he was wealthy, could buy anything, and yet for some reason was still drawn to Jesus. You see, if you read your Bible, you'll notice that right before chapter 19 starts, it says here that as he drew near to Jericho, speaking of Jesus, this is not on the, on the, on the scriptures behind me, this is just hot off the fresh, you will see that Jesus heals a blind beggar as he's coming into Jericho. So before he gets to Jericho, on the way there, he heals a blind beggar. Remember, Jesus, shut up. Jesus, shut up. And every time he was told to shut up, he'd yell even louder, and he gets healed. And you can imagine that people were probably running into town, shouting the good news, so-and-so who's been blind because they all would have known him, was healed by someone named Jesus. And all of a sudden, the crowd, listen, there was no Instagram, Facebook, or TV. There was no cable. There was no entertainment. The entertainment was someone would come into town and shout out something that happened, and everybody would congregate. That was your entertainment. Jesus, this man Jesus, healed the blind beggar. You mean the one that's always asking us for money? Yeah, that one, he's blind. Praise God. And so Zacchaeus probably caught wind of this just doing his usual rounds and thought, what is this that's going on? I must check this out. All of his success came at a steep price. Do you know someone in that position? Maybe you do. Maybe you are that person in that position. Maybe you've achieved a level of success only to find yourself lonely and empty. Zacchaeus was wealthy, but he wasn't happy. The Bible says in Mark 8, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? I believe that Zacchaeus was living this out in his life. He had given everything, most likely sacrificed relationships, most likely sacrificed family, most likely sacrificed his time, his energy, his youth to get to where he was going, and he climbed a ladder all the way to the top only to realize that he was leaning against the wrong building. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to live the kind of life that builds a, builds a, 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 a temple onto myself. I don't want to build a life climbing to get to something that really does not do what I thought it would do. I understand that life is short, and I understand that I have one life on this earth, and I need to make it count. And I believe that Zacchaeus was starting to feel this inside. So what price are you willing to pay for success, for, for wealth, for fame, for belonging, for acceptance? You see, Zacchaeus paid this steep price for his wealth. <laughs> but he knew that something was missing. And it was time to fill that void that he was obviously been sensing for some time now. You know, Scripture tells us that he was trying to see Jesus. I love this. Because I don't know about you, but one of my, my wife and my you know, pastimes that we like to do is we like to go catch live shows. So we go watch some music and and uh, it's always funny because I'm, I'm not the tallest guy, but I'm also not the shortest. I'm about average, maybe a little bit above average. But no matter where we go, I can normally always see what's happening. And I always love standing around. And I, I, as much as I watch the musicians, I love watching the people. I'm a people watcher. I, 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 I just love how people interact with one another and, and just see all these idiosyncrasies just happening in real time. And I always love the, the short people like, you know, and at every concert we go to, there's always one muscly guy that shows up, and his only job is to find the short people and say, you, on my shoulders. And he always goes down, and they lift them up, and he's all tough for about three minutes, and then his knees start shaking, and, you know, it's going on here. But see, Zac Zacchaeus was in this situation. Here it is. On the account of the crowd, he could not see Jesus. There was an obstacle between him and the one they called Jesus. And it was the crowd. And here's the beautiful thing about this picture this morning that I want to share with you. Isn't it weird that some 2,000 years later, there's still obstacles that get in our way of seeking Jesus. But what I love about Zacchaeus is he did not let the obstacle stop him from his goal of seeing who this Jesus was. Finding out what it was all about. This beautiful thing happens. Why would he seek Jesus? 
We have to assume that he had heard some rumors or maybe he had heard that he was a great teacher or maybe that he was a great rabbi or possibly that he was a prophet, maybe that he was the healer. He had to hear some rumblings or something and perhaps being in the upper echelon of society at the time, maybe there was a plan already in place and maybe there was a reward. We don't know what his motives are, but this we know for sure was that Zacchaeus was seeking out Jesus and he wasn't going to allow any obstacles to stop him from getting there. And I think that the lesson that I'm trying to teach you this morning is that it doesn't matter what obstacles are standing between you and Jesus. There is a way through it. There is a way around it. There is a way that you can push it aside and seek the one who can touch your soul. And Zacchaeus comes up with a mighty great plan. I told you, small people, are sm they're smart, man, and they are crafty. And they, they have all sorts of genes. I call them MacGyvers. Anybody remember MacGyver? MacGyver could do anything with anything. He was always in different problems, and he'd always find out with just a toothbrush and maybe a pack of matches and, I don't know, some cleaner. He always found his way out of trouble and always got his bad guy. These are short people. They're MacGyvers. They figure things out. So here we see, comes up with a plan. You know what? Here's a sycamore tree. And, 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 and what the Bible's alluding to is that he was so excited to see Jesus that he ran ahead of the crowd to get himself into a position where he would be higher than everybody and he would see what everybody was talking about. Now, there's a couple things that I want to point out to you in this time. Zacchaeus, who was a man of authority, probably held himself with a certain amount of dignity. There are certain things that are probably expected of him. And one of the things that you certainly did not do in these times as a man was ever to show your legs. They would have long tunics that they would wear. Showing your legs was a shameful thing, right? So all you who are wearing shorts here this morning, no condemnation. We're in the new covenant. But if we were in the old covenant, we would be in trouble, right? And so Zacchaeus lifts up, I imagine, his tunic. I don't know if you've ever tried to run in one of those robes. doesn't go very well. Would have lifted them up, shown his legs, and didn't give a rip, and ran to a position where he could see Jesus. And it's this beautiful picture of us throwing off the confines of people that want that, uh, the confines of the things that people want to put onto us, the shame or the guilt. They, they, they want to throw things on us so that we don't seek Jesus. And Zacchaeus doesn't give a rip. And if he don't give a rip, and he was a small man, and I'm a little bit of a bigger man, then maybe I should not give a rip of the obstacles that stand in my way and find some sort of way that I can seek out my Lord and my Savior. It would have been difficult to find Jesus in a crowd of 2,000, 3,000 people, right? I go to Walmart, and if I take my eyes off of my wife or my son, I'm in immediate panic mode. Like, where are you? I don't feel safe. You ever been to Walmart on a Saturday? You got to be prayed up. <laughs> you got you to have the whole armor of God. You don't, don't, don't forget any piece. Even worse, Costco. We don't... Avoid that. Are you laughing because you know it's true? You go to Costco on a Tuesday in the afternoon. You book time off work if you have to. But whatever costs, you do not go on a Saturday or a Sunday, especially if it's a long weekend. Forget about it. So here he is. He's, 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 he's wanting to catch a glimpse. And, and here's the amazing thing about Zacchaeus is you've got to imagine how many people he ripped off. Like I'm just going through all of this scenario to paint a picture that Zacchaeus maybe ain't the bad guy that we like to point him out to be. He's ripped off everybody. Could you imagine if I had ripped off all of you people, right? And then I just want to just, you know, cruise with you, amongst you, and be with you. And, and maybe some of you not being as sanctified as I would hope you would be would greet me with a pointy something in my side as I walked by. you got to think of what's happening here. Zacchaeus is in a crowd. He's vulnerable. He's small. At any minute, someone could be the hero of, of what the, the town that's there, Jericho, and take out Mr. Zacchaeus. You know what I'm saying? Might pay a little bit price of it, but everybody would hail you as the hero. Right? And so here he is against all odds. He's positioning himself to see this Jesus that they're talking about. Something gave him hope that Jesus could transform the miserable life that he seemed to be living. And I don't know about you, but he began to seek out a change. He needed a Savior, and he had heard that his name was Jesus. And so many people today are seeking a new beginning. Maybe you are. Maybe Zacchaeus is you, and you are Zacchaeus. 
Maybe today you need a fresh start. Maybe you need a do-over. Maybe you need a mulligan. You know what a mulligan is? It's when you go golfing with all of your friends and you've never golfed and you try to hit the ball and it bounces backwards or maybe two feet forwards and they look at you with such kindness and compassion and they go, that's a mulligan, try again. You get a do-over because of your bad sportsmanship or maybe whatever circumstances, you get to redo it. It's a freebie. They, see, they don't charge you any, you know, however they take score in golf. I should learn a lot more before I start using golf as an example next time. <laughs> maybe you need a mulligan today. Maybe you need a do-over. See, the good news is that Zacchaeus got one, and you can get one as well. You know, there's a scripture found in 2 Corinthians 5.17. I think it was the second scripture that I learned by heart when I became a follower of Jesus. And it goes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And Zacchaeus was starting to lay hold of the fact that there was something great about this man named Jesus. Number two, change involves allowing Jesus into your life. See, it's one thing to seek Jesus, but it's a whole other thing to begin to allow Jesus into your life so that he can change you from the inside out. Look at verses 5 and 7 in Luke 19 as we continue the story. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came down and re received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone into to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. <laughs> I love this. Zacchaeus hits the spiritual jackpot, right? If you think about it, jackpot. He's just trying to see what's going on, and all of a sudden Jesus calls him by name, by the way, which probably would have made me fall out of the tree, but somehow Zacchaeus keeps it together, and Jesus says, come down, and he climbs down. I'm not sure how big the tree was. It could have been four feet. Remember, he was small, so that's really large for him. I don't know what's going on there, but some way he finds his way down, and Jesus saw Zacchaeus, and he calls him by name, and he tells him that he must stay at his house. Now, I've shared this before, so this is nothing new, but maybe you haven't heard this before. To, to, to eat together in the culture and the time period here was to accept one another on a level that was greater than just having dinner. It was like, I accept you into my life. And so if I made dinner plans with Tom, and for some reason, Tom, you weren't able to show up in this time period, I would take great offense to this. Because you weren't rejecting my dinner, you were rejecting me. This is how they would have thought. And so the reason why everybody was so upset and, and begrudging of the situation is that he went to be the guest of a sinner. And it wasn't so much that he was going to be a guest of a sinner. It was that on the base level of what was happening, he was, Jesus was saying, Zacchaeus, I accept you. I desire you and I want you to be on my team. And this is a beautiful picture of how Jesus comes down into our lives when everybody's saying, Brian, you're a sinner. Don't I know it? At 16, I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew that I was doing a lot of things wrong. Jesus comes down and says, Brian, I accept you. Wow. 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 But when Jesus called me by name, at the age of 16 in a good old Pentecostal church in the middle of a baptismal service. I had to respond to that. And here's where we have to go a little bit further than seeking. We have to respond to the seeking. And when Jesus calls us by name, we have to come down from whatever situation or whatever tree that we've been hiding in that we thought might give us some cover, but that we can watch him from a distance, not get too involved in. And then Jesus calls us by name, and we have got to come down from where we have been hiding. And we have to come into his presence with thanksgiving and praise. Zacchaeus had found Jesus, the one whom he was seeking. And not only did he find him, but now he's hosting him at his house. And Zacchaeus, understanding the culture and the time, understood that Jesus on some level was saying, I love you and I accept you, but I've got more for you. Now Zacchaeus could have told Jesus, you know what Jesus, I didn't really tidy up the house this week, maybe another time. Could have made any kind of excuse to not jump into it. And isn't it funny how sometimes when we're seeking Jesus and then we find Jesus and it looks a little bit different than what we thought, 
Maybe the answer to our prayers comes in a different form or a different fashion or, or in a different time, and we go, well, I don't know. And then all of a sudden we start backing up and we start making excuses, and I don't know. And we realize, you know what, change is hard work. <laughs> change is actually work. It's like a full-time career. You want to keep changing? It's work, man. It's work. I'm not who I used to be, but I certainly ain't who I want to be. But I got to put some time and some effort, and I got to grow. I got to learn. I got to read. I got to dive into this thing because I know this thing, every time I get into it, some way, shape, or form changes me for the better. And I'll tell you what, when I don't get into this thing, I definitely know it. And if I'm not in this thing for a few days, other people know it. <laughs> right? Starts with me knowing it, then it starts with those who really know me knowing it, then it starts with everybody knowing it. What's wrong with that guy? Mm. Hasn't been allowing Jesus into the, his life the way that he should. So Zacchaeus, instead of making excuses, invites Jesus into his messy life. In our scripture, we see that Jesus made the move towards Zacchaeus, the man who was despised by so many others but he was loved so much by the Lord. Wow. And as Jesus is leaving to go to the home of Zacchaeus, you can hear the disgust from the folks in the crowd as Jesus walks away with Zacchaeus. They're all mumbling and murmuring, Zacchaeus, he's the worst of the worst. That short little fill in the blank. That guy who steals that thief, is there anything worse than a thief? And they're all whispering to one another, why would he choose him? Doesn't he know? Doesn't he know? The beautiful thing is, that, oh, he knew. And he knew so much more. And in getting their heads wrapped around the fact that Jesus would actually interact with a sinner rather than go to someone holy's life, they missed the whole point. That Jesus was coming to seek and to save that which was lost. They didn't even consider that perhaps Zacchaeus, the sinner, could become a new creation. That wasn't even on their radar. And so I see myself in two places in this scripture. I see myself as Zacchaeus, who sometimes has to seek Jesus out and allow him into my life. But then also sometimes I see myself in the crowd. And sometimes things are happening around and i got to check my heart because I go, God, don't you know who that is? Right? We're good at doing that. We don't say it out loud, but we think it. Lord, how, how could you bless that person? Lord, how, how, what, what is, Lord, hello, me, hi, right? When instead of being joyful and celebratory with those who God is moving in their lives, right, we get bitter or jealous or angry. And I, so I see myself in two places in this store and I'm going, God, you know, I'm, I'm Zacchaeus, but God, I'm also in the crowd. Here I am, Lord, help me. <laughs> i got to lift up and run to Jesus for some help. And so we see ourselves here in this story. Jesus entered into the home of Zacchaeus, and most likely with his disciples, and most likely with an entourage. He always kind of toured with an entourage. That's just who he was. People wanted to be around him, and I don't blame them. I think he would have been a lot of fun to be around. Jesus entered to his home, and I'm sure that they ate together, and Jesus probably took advantage of the opening and shared some real wisdom and some real life with Zacchaeus and those who were there took this opportunity to maybe share something that wasn't really recorded here, but something happens when Jesus is in the home. And because Zacchaeus has allowed Jesus in, first he sought after him, he seeked the one who was named Jesus, and now he's allowed him into his house, a miracle is taking place. Something beautiful is happening. When we move into the stage where we allow Jesus in, not just to seek and to be sought after, but to actually allow him into our life, into the corners of our hearts that maybe shame is there, or maybe guilt is there. We just can't shake it off for one reason or another. When we actually say, Jesus, here I am, all of me. There's no use trying to hide it, because you know it. You see it, you understand it, and you are the healer of it. And so I'm going to take this place and take this moment to allow my Lord and Savior in so that all the junk can come out. And I don't know about you, but when that begins to click, something miraculous happens. And you begin to feel like a new creation. When you talk about that scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, talking about a new creation, you don't just read it. You begin to understand it so much more. The old brine has passed away. And look, there's a new one. It's, it's not an updated version. It's not even a repaired version. It's a new version. And I don't know about you, but a new version could do with. And so we see this happening here. Beautiful, beautiful story. 
where he changes you from the inside out. That's where we got to get to. And third, we finish with this. Some final thoughts from verses 8 to 10. It says, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And here's this beautiful picture that God is painting before us this morning. Is that when you seek the Lord, and it don't matter if there's obstacles standing in your way, but you say, Lord, come hell or high water, I'm going to seek you. Because I know that you are my strength. I know that you are my joy. I know that you are the only thing that can fill the void that I feel inside of me. You're the only one that can fill this empty heart. You're the only one that can give me a real desire. Lord, you are the one who will heal me and touch me and change me. And you are the one that brings joy even in the midst of storms. And Lord, you're the one that can speak to the waves in my life and to to tell them to be still. Lord, you are the one that we need and you are the one that we want. And when we seek him with all of our heart, the Bible promises that he will be found. And when he is found like Zacchaeus, we take the moment to really accept what's happening and we invite him into our life. Not the version of our life that is sanitized and clean. Listen, I know you're probably like me. Maybe you're not. Maybe supernaturally you can keep your house clean from top to bottom at any time, any day. I envy you. I don't know how you do it. You need to teach a course and we'll show up. But here's the thing I do know. When I know you're coming over, I'm busy. I'm busy cleaning. Because I want to paint a picture to you that it's okay. But I guarantee you the minute you leave, right, it goes back to what's happening. Toys all over Stepping on little army men. You know how fun that is when you let the dog out at 2 o'clock in the morning? Ow! And then you find a Lego. Ow! And everybody in the house thinks you're having a revival. Whoa! Ah! I know what it's like. I'm not talking about some sanitized version of our life where we say, Jesus, come in, everything is perfect. That's not what he said he was about. He was coming to seek and to save that which was lost. Lost is messy. Lost is scary. You know, just the other day, I'm a grown man, okay? I'm, 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 I'm okay to admit my weaknesses. Because I think it's the only way that I can grow forward from it. I was out in the woods with Peter and my dad, and we were having a great time. And, and I knew that the time was coming to an end, and we were, we, we were doing something that we like doing, we were, that French people like doing. We are picking wild garlic, okay? El de Bois, that's what it's called, okay? Don't judge my French pronunciation. El de Bois. This stuff is like gold in the French community. You'll see people on the side of the road, on the highway, say, El de Bois, $40. And you're thinking, what is that? I know why it's $40. Because you got to go into the woods, get eaten alive by mosquitoes, fight with centipedes. Then you got to go home and you got to clean them, which is a task and a half to do. I always like the picking part. Then I get home, I go, oh, yeah, this is real work. $40 of art? I, I, I might pay it next year. It might be worth it. I mean, I enjoy the fellowship. But I knew it was coming to an end, and I, I, I got a little greedy. I'll admit it. I got greedy. I just wanted to put a little bit more in my bag, so I had one more jar. And uh, all of a sudden, my dad and Peter are close to each other, and I start walking in a direction. And I knew where I was going. I, I had I'd just come from there. I'm walking in this direction, and I get distracted for just a moment. And I turn around. Guys? Guys? Ha, ha, ha. It's not funny. Guys? Guys? And I start walking. And I'm like, okay, I came from this way. If I go this way, I know that the truck's parked up. I'll go there. And I start walking. And I come to a stream that I have never seen before. I don't remember seeing a stream. And I start thinking to myself, who's going to come after me? I was lost. Can I tell you something? I knew that I wasn't lost, lost, but I was lost enough to just have a small little issue with anxiety and panic. And so I followed the stream. And finally I end up on a road. And I know the road, but the road is really far from where we parked. (laughs) 
Then I see someone driving in. I run back in the woods like, I don't know. I don't know. Like I'm doing something wrong. I don't know. Okay? Lost doesn't make sense, okay? Doesn't make sense, but it's scary. And it's messy. I was filled. I, I, I looked, I, I don't know, man. I just looked like I had just been living in the woods for some time and filled with mud, mosquito bites everywhere. Even though Peter's always like, make sure you spray. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Come out hives everywhere. It's, I was lost. And so, so Jesus came to seek that which was lost. And lost can be scary. And lost can be confusing. Lost is where I don't want to be. And I don't need to be. Because even when I am lost, there's someone who will be looking for me. And his name is Jesus. It says here, and Zacchaeus stood, and he said to the Lord, Behold. See, see, here's the beautiful thing about it. Something happened when Jesus came into Zacchaeus' house. That when Zacchaeus entered the house, he was a sinner. He was a thief, a robber, a con man. Something happened from the time that they sat down to eat together that caused Zacchaeus to stand up. Have you ever been at a dinner party and someone stands up to make some sort of announcement? Like, that's a big deal. Normally we're just conversing, we're sitting. I don't need to stand up and say, well, I really enjoy your friendship, and then sit back down. We just don't do that. But Zacchaeus stands up because he wants to make a point here to all those who are there. And he begins to say, Lord... If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll restore it fourfold. But he proceeded by saying, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Now, if you do some study, it would suggest that when he was saying this, it wasn't just the half of the goods that he currently had. He was saying, from this day forward, whatever I earn honestly, I will give half of it to the poor. And if I've ripped anybody off, I will give them fourfold. See, because when you encounter Jesus, real change happens. So you seek him, right? Then you allow him in, and then you've got to commit to this new way of life. And this was Zacchaeus' way of committing to the new life that he had found in Jesus. And after he says this, Jesus says, wow, today salvation has come to this house. Because he understood that something great had happened in Zacchaeus. The love of money is what drove him to do what he did for a living. For Zacchaeus, money had become his God, his idol. And in front of Jesus and all those around, he makes a bold declaration, I am laying down my idol at the feet of Jesus. And I'm trading it in for this new life that I've been hearing Jesus talk about. Jesus, Zacchaeus is so convinced for his need for Jesus that he lays it down feet of Jesus. This morning, is there something you need to lay down at the feet of Jesus? Is there something that you just have to lay down at the foot of the cross that you know that perhaps isn't right for you? Perhaps you've been holding on to a grudge. Perhaps you've got anxiety that riddles you from being the man or the woman that God wants you to be. Perhaps you have been holding on to something of the world that you know. Maybe it's been in secret. Maybe it's been in private, but, but you've been holding on to it. You're doing your best to follow Jesus, but, but now is the time to let go, to lay it down and to trade it in for the goodness and the kindness of God Most High. I promise you this, that whatever you lay down, God's got infinitely better for you. So much better. For the life that He brings, brings just that life. And life in abundance it doesn't carry with it the shame or the guilt or the condemnation or the, the questioning. It, it brings a joy and a peace that cannot be surpassed by anything I've ever experienced in my life. Wow. Notice Jesus says salvation has come to your house. Probably meaning that there were others who had responded to the message or perhaps even changed by what happened with Zacchaeus. So the path to change, it's simple. It's just seeking Jesus. Despite the obstacles and allowing Him to heal us, to build us up, to grant us His divine wisdom or His awesome power in our lives that makes all the change in the world. You know, a leadership podcast I listen to, it always starts off with them chit-chatting and then right before they go into the bulk of the meat of what they want to talk to, 
the guy goes, welcome to Leadership Lean In, where we don't promise perfection, but we do promise progress. And I love it. Because sometimes I feel like perfection can never be attained, but progress is so much more manageable. Every day, he says, we're inspiring to draw closer to Jesus and to become better leaders, better followers. And so today, I hope that you are encouraged by the word and the story of Zacchaeus and how we can have a path to change, to follow that he left as an example for us. To seek him, to allow him in, and then to commit to the change. And so, Father, I thank you and I bless these people. And Lord, this day, if there's anyone who needs change in their life, anyone who needs a touch, Lord, I pray that Holy Spirit right now, that you would grant them the strength, that you would grant them, Lord God, the tools necessary to make the change that I feel and I know that they've been desiring to make in their lives. Holy Spirit, if there's guilt or shame, I pray that you would rid us of that. Lord, if there's secret of things that we've been holding on to, addictions or sinful natures or even bad habits, Father, I pray that you would not only deliver us from it, but Lord, you would heal us of the reason why we keep going to those things instead of you. Father, I thank you that you are our source. I love you, I honor you, and I thank you for my family here today. May you strengthen them in Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, maybe you're here today, and maybe you've sought after him, but you've not necessarily allowed him into your life. Maybe you're here today as a visitor, or maybe you're here, you've been here a few times, but you've not quite made that decision to follow Jesus. The Bible says if we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that we shall be saved. We know this. We know that even on our best day, we all fall short. We all bumble through life. We all know that even if you aren't aware, if you, if you even went to church once, you know the Ten Commandments, you know that we break them. You know that we're not perfect. There's not one of us here that is perfect. And if you are perfect, I'm sorry we probably ruined you in the last hour. You are no longer perfect. Bad company corrupts good character. I'm sorry. I, I can't help it. But this I do know is that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if you have been feeling lost, maybe you've not known what your purpose in life is, maybe you've been riddled with that guilt or the shame of things that you've done or things that have happened, this I know, that Jesus loves you. He has a plan for you. And it begins by asking him to become your Lord and your Savior. So we do something very simple here, not to embarrass anyone, but we put a simple prayer up on the back wall and we say it together because we're family. We love one another. We want to make sure that if you want to have the opportunity to say this prayer, that you can do so in the comfort and the safety of your friends and your family here. Amen? So I'm going to invite you to say this prayer, maybe for the first time, maybe for the thousandth. But this I know, that something needs to change. And the only way that change really lasts is if we give it to Jesus. Amen? So let us pray. Jesus, thank you for paying the price for my salvation. I ask you to forgive me of every sin. And I repent, and I am purposing to change the way I think and live. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, help me to learn about you and to grow in this kingdom lifestyle. I declare you're my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for receiving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer, I'm going to invite you to be bold and to share with one of us that you said that prayer. We'll be able to get you on the right path to getting to know this Jesus who has changed our lives and continues to change our life. In Jesus' name.